as I am the director of the, the caucus center on urban and regional policy here. My colleague, uh, Professor Kaufman, is in China tonight. Uh, we're not exactly sure why we think he's negotiating peace or something. <laughs> um, one of those deep things. I, I came up to the lectern, and for the first time ever, uh, I found a copy of the New Testament on the lectern. <laughs> I'm not sure how that will relate to our discussion tonight on environmental policy, but someone may be trying to send us a message about priorities. <laughs> um, let me make a couple of uh, very quick announcements. Two weeks from tonight, uh, we will all, uh, I think, have a strong inclination to uh, debrief the midterm election. Um, if there are any questions that you want to make sure, or any races that uh, you want to make sure we uh, try to focus on a little bit in the context of that evening, uh, uh, shoot us an email, uh, and uh, we'll be happy to try to focus on those to the extent that we have any information. Um, on uh, particular races. A week from tonight, um, which is Halloween, uh, you don't have to come uh, uh, dressed up for that session. Uh, we will have uh, on our panel a couple of folks from local media uh, who will be talking to us about uh, the ways in which they uh, believe they do or anticipate that they can have influence um, over uh, both local and uh, larger uh, policy issues. And I think with that, oh, we're going to be very respectful of our time at the end of tonight's session. Uh, David Price starts the pitch, I believe, at 8.09. Uh, we'll, we'll miss the beginning of that, but um, we uh, will respect your time. And uh, traffic. So, you want to come up? Yes, sir. Sure. You need this? I need, I need the brimstone, which will come up. And then. Uh, hello, my name is Aleshri Bayak. I teach at the journalism school here. I'm a science journalist, former radio producer for Science Friday. And um, I was asked by Jonathan Kaufman, the director of our day school, who's teaching this course, Ted, um, to, to Try to find some panelists and and try to find a way to kind of crack open this discussion. And I have definitely achieved the first, which is assemble an awesome group of panelists. And so we'll hear from them in probably about six or seven minutes. Um, it's up to you after we do some of the discussion to continue asking uh, questions to try to, to break open this issue. So um, this is a bit of food for thought, and uh, this is a uh, the first of a five-part series, short documentaries done by Ian Cheney for Undark Magazine. Um, maybe Tom will talk a little bit later about um, some more of Undark. You should definitely check it out. I, I once upon a time wrote for them. Um, and it's a science uh, journalism magazine at uh, the Night Science Journalism Fellowship at MIT, uh, which all of our panelists are connected to uh, in one way or another, uh, the institution or the fellowship. But without further ado, I'm going to hope that the lights will dim and we can start this. So one of the most important things that I think we've really learned from our research over the years is how do you bring this issue home? Climate change is the policy problem from hell. I mean, you almost couldn't design a worse fit with our underlying psychology or our institutions of decision making for this particular problem. As environmental challenges go, climate change seems to be in a league of its own. And in many ways, it's a matter of scale. Climate change demands that we imagine a phenomenon is larger than ourselves, both in space and time. And you could argue that as creatures, as animals, we evolved in highly localized landscapes, 
worrying about how to make it through another week or most another winter, our imaginations are relatively limited in scope. Here's a simple question. What's the first thought or image that comes to your mind when you hear the words global warming? Now, I've asked that of a nationally representative sample of Americans over and over and over again, and it's incredibly revealing. I mean, I learned so much from this. I mean, it's to the point where I actually know what's inside people's head. I could be sitting at or standing in an airport line, and I can look at the you know, 100 people around me, and I can tell you, I can't tell you which people, but I can tell you what will be the most common image that comes to most people's mind. And the first thing that comes to many people is images of melting ice. How many people live on the shores of the Arctic Ocean, live in Antarctica, or live next to a melting glacier? And so what it does is those images also reinforce the false perception that climate change is far away. One of the main barriers that we have to public engagement is the sense that it's psychologically distant. That's partly distant in space, that this is something happening at the poles or far away, maybe in a developing country, but not where I live. And also the sense that it's distant in time. The challenge of imagining climate change, a planet-wide phenomenon that stretches across an enormous physical scale, is compounded by the challenge of imagining time scales that outlast human lifespans. It was actually life changing for me when I started studying this because I realized that something like 20% of the carbon that every one of us emits today will still be in the atmosphere a thousand years from now. If we were to stop burning fossil fuels, Something like 80% of the CO2 we have in the system will get taken up by the oceans. But that will happen over thousands to tens of thousands of years. So we have to understand that we are actually affecting the Earth's climate, not just for a century or two. We are fundamentally changing the Earth's climate for tens of thousands of years. And frankly, we don't think about those time scales very well. Economists will say anything even 100 years out is worth nothing because of discount. Um, well, the question is if we are changing the surface of the earth in a profound way, not just for a few generations, but for tens of thousands of generations of humans, um, does that matter? How do we think about time, time scales? Very few of us have experienced a century of time. None of us have experienced a millennium of time. If you say sea level is going to be this high in 50 years, that just sounds so far out there. To a geologist, to me, that's not so far out there. Climate change may demand a new kind of perspective, a great stretching of our minds to confront a phenomenon. It seems distant, but reality surrounds us, as insidious and ubiquitous as the carbon gathering in the atmosphere, like a fog. So let me do some, some introductions. I think you'll recognize. I know this is pretty loud.
Okay, much better. Okay, good. Um, so, so I'm going to start uh, with um, Mira Summer Romanian here on my left. Um, Mira is an award-winning journalist, former MIT Night Science Journalism Fellow, and the author of A River Runs Again, India's Natural World in Crisis. Her work has been featured in Nature, New Yorker.com, Virginia Quarterly Weekly a Review, Undark, and Orion. Um, you're based in Cape Cod. Um, and she's lately been working on a series for Inside Climate News, which I hope she will tell us a lot more about, um, which is looking for kind of local impact effects of these issues around America. So she's uh, been busy traveling a lot. And I'm sure you have something to say about midterm. Um, I'm, I'm going to end with uh, Dr. Solomon, actually. Um, Tom Zeller is the um, editor in chief of Undark Magazine. He's also a former night science journalist fellow. Um, he spent two decades covering um, issues that we're going to talk about tonight, energy policy, uh, technology, the environment, um, uh, 12 years with the New York Times, uh, later with the Huffington Post and other uh, National Geographic, um, and has written uh, Al Jazeera America, um, Bloomberg, and other places. Um, and he is the both editor-in-chief and co-founder of Undark, um, the, the science magazine that ring this, this series. Um, and so turning now to Susan's. Um, so Dr. Solomon is the Lee and Geraldine Martin Professor of Environmental Studies at MIT. Um, and she's the only person I know that has an Antarctic glacier named in her honor. Um, that's awesome. You can buy like a star for like five bucks, but a glacier. Um, that's a continent uh, where she's done a lot of her groundbreaking science um, in the 80s uh, around um, the issue of ozone and uh, chemistry. So in, in, in 2000, she received the National Medal of Science, um, the US's highest honor for scientists, um, for her work around the Antarctic ozone. Um, she's also been awarded the AGU's Bowie Medal, the American Meteorological Society's Rossby Medal, and the Grand Medaille of the Academy of Sciences in Paris. Um, she served as the co-chair on the fourth assessment uh, of the IPCC, which we'll be hearing a lot more about, um, uh, providing scientific information to those uh, decision makers, and I hope we hear a lot more about what those negotiations are like. Um, but I think I will now um, turn it over to us, to, 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 to everyone here. Um, I'm going to be leaning on my fellow panelists um, to also serve as kind of co-moderators, especially the two journalists to my left, um, since they are amazing at asking questions, and sometimes I blank out. I'm still kind of learning the ropes of how to run one of these events. See, Ira Flato would never put me on radio. I was always kind of typing up all the questions and the billboards for MPR. Um, but I think that the first thing I wanted to kind of seize on was what Ian's trying to mention here, which is, um, and the issue of taking something that's the kind of problem from hell, quote unquote, and, and localizing it and making it kind of tangible. And so maybe we could kind of uh, share with, with the audience kind of the, maybe something that's lately come to your mind. Maybe it's not melting ice or a polar bear, a polar bear stuck on an ice floe, right? Those are these, right, these examples that the media perpetuates. But what kind of examples should folks take away? Where to begin? Um, <laughs> better, so I can do less. Um, where to begin? I mean, this, it seems like every my, my focus within environmental journalism has been so many different arenas, from energy to agriculture water and it's it's a constant awakening process for myself to just realize that every single aspect um there's a climate change impact to it and that's like a learning curve for me who this is my beat and this is what i read and study continually and yet it's constantly happening so to try to get into the heads of ordinary people who this is not what they're thinking about and asking them why they're not thinking about it um I think there's good, it's good to have some sympathy about why people are not thinking about it, uh, and then also to step back and look at the larger reasons for the, the, the structural systems that are in place that help you to not think about it or to think about it 
um, not scientific. Maybe for Susan, I can start with uh, you know, the, the recent news of this month of the latest kind of like report, and maybe what examples you saw seized upon by media to kind of help illustrate that story. Well, um, I think I just prefer to actually talk about the, the one takeaway from that report that really was new and that I found really. Uh, amazing and interesting was the, the chapter on the spread of uh, vector borne diseases. So, just hold it a little closer. Okay. Thank you. So, in particular, uh, that report benefited from new research that's happened in the last several years looking at things like the spread of ticks that they are applying to ticks. And you know, clearly, in a warmer world, uh, there will be more reproduction. Of the of the, the ticks within a given season, so there'll be more of them. We already see the same thing happening with the pine bark beetle in the west, which is killing trees. But um, that, that seems to be uh, a, a manifestation of the longer length of the season. So ticks and mosquitoes, you know, I just hate mosquitoes. <laughs> so for me, the notion that they fever could probably not push it to Boston. But um, you know, pushing to Texas within the next 50 years is, is really kind of disturbing. Um, and I think it, it brings home an aspect of the climate change problem that makes it a lot more personal in the sense that disease is something, human health is something where when we understand that our health is at risk, we take environmental issues differently than we don't feel personally threatened. I mean, you saw that with, for example, the ozone layer, which, as you mentioned, I've done a lot of work on the fact that um, decreased levels of stratospheric ozone result in more skin cancer cases. It's something that people could really understand. It wasn't like, you know, ice melting in the yard. It was very deeply personal. And I think that's uh, an example, not the only one, but the issue of the uh, vector borne diseases is an example of something pretty serious. Now, you can say, well, we can. Control that, you know, we used to have malaria throughout North America. We control that. It's it's true that if you're prepared to keep on large amounts of pesticides as we did when we uh, push back the mosquito, um, you, can, you can do that. It raises perhaps other questions that might be disturbing. Uh, but it's uh, it, it would definitely be a serious thing to adapt to. And of course, the issue of increased heat waves. Um, increased temperatures in heat waves and what that does in terms of human mortality is, uh, is another one that is somewhat um, worrisome to me personally. So those are the kinds of things that you see in that report that I think help to bring it home and um, make the issue clearer in terms of its impacts on us. Um, <coughs> what's the question? <laughs> so I would love maybe some yeah, examples from your reporting. That's that? Like, Examples, right? Localizing yeah. what's stuck with you. Uh, you know, it's funny because I, I, I approach I, I've approached this topic as a reporter for a really long time. In the last several years, I'm looking at it as an editor, uh, as freelance writers bringing ideas uh, about climate change stories to me, and I'm, you know, as a group, we're deciding what, what works and what doesn't. And you know, I, I really had to find I've, I've discovered that I'm becoming somewhat cynical about. All of this, in, in a way, because um, all the stories start to sound the same. They start to blur together. Um, I get one pitch after another that, that says, "Well, I want to do a story on uh, you know this this particular animal, which is the poster child for climate change in on this island." You are wanting to do a story on this lake um, that is drying up, and it's the poster child for climate change in this, in this part of the country. So it, it's it's funny. It's become very hard and. and um, one one exercise I did before I came here is I wanted to remind myself how far back um, the reporting on climate change kind of went. And Susan, you would know better than I do, but I, just in a scan of the um, of uh, LexisNexis, I, found, I think I found one of the earliest mentions of global warming in the UK study from the early 1980s, maybe like 81. Um, and then by the time we get to 1998, early 2000s, we're already starting to see. The words desensitize. 
and climate change um, uh, in stories. And, and I think that's really, I mean, and that's already 20 years ago now. And, and here we are talking about this exact same issue with all the same parameters. The science has hardened a little bit. There are still uncertainties out there. And uh, we're, we're starting to drill in the Arctic. Um, this is this just happened today, I think. So, I, I, I mean, this is a long way of getting around to what do you, does localizing, and not to other about what you're doing here, but, but even localizing the issue, to my mind, doesn't really push the needle in, in one way or another for the very reasons that Ian was sort of highlighted in this film. It, it still remains this sort of very distant, um, it's not going to happen to me. And in the rich world, let's face it, we're, we're going to, uh, our experience of climate change is going to be very different from that of, of people in other parts of the world. They don't have the resources to respond. Um, and yet, that's, this is one of the key agents of change. It's kind of convincing Americans that they need to care about this, convincing Europeans that they need to care about this. So I guess I don't really have an answer of like what I think. You know, does localizing actually like push the needle? Does, I, I, I sort of throw that question out to you know, maybe someone on the panel. Yeah. Um, I definitely share the cynicism that I think a lot of environmental journalists and probably scientists dealing with this do grapple with this. And I don't even like to bring it up, especially at a university where there's young people who don't want to like tell you that there's anything to be cynical about. But but <laughs> to also be honest, there's something um, like right after the 2016 election, uh, there was a great talk by Jill LaCour. She was talking to the Neiman Fellows over at Harvard. Um, and she had done a long New Yorker piece about polling. And I think we were uh, drowning in polling statistics and you know the needles moving and everybody making their predictions about what was going to happen and, um, and feeling like we have so much information. This is so great. Like, how can we not know everything? Because look, it's all there. And and she spoke about how when polling began, it was people going door to door and talking for like a half hour with somebody at the door to get their opinions on something. And she brought up the point that something else happened in the process of that. You know, something happened to that person at that, like both those people at that threshold. That something happened. And while I have no idea, you know, I've done eight stories now, written by Climate News, that have been on um, the focus of the series is called Finding Middle Ground, and it's about going to very conservative areas, areas that voted heavily for Trump and are aligned with the Republican Party that is not taking any action and taking a lot of action against climate um, change work and uh, asking people what are, are feeling direct impacts from things climate change, whether it's peach farmers in Georgia who had a failed harvest because it didn't get cold enough in the winter to set the fruit, or uh, Wisconsin dog sledders who can't depend on snows to do this thing that they love to do that they feed their 27 dogs all year round to do, and then they can't depend on the races. Like, very like real practical things in their, in their lives. Um, but I would spend, you know, usually a week in these very small rural areas, and I'd, you know, there'd be three people in the story, but I would have talked to 40. And, you know, there's some little tiny part of me that tries to, um, you know, if I wake up in the middle of the night, like, what is the word? How many lights on a coast does that do anything? And they're going to keep drilling in the Arctic. But just the idea that maybe also something is happening with that engagement between humans, like there is some little part of me that is. Um, tries to maybe perhaps desperately latch on to uh, the idea that, that, that there is something else happening because that is what is not happening now. It's because of the silo, siloization or <laughs> siloing of, of just um, <coughs> people in this country, not just online, but even in real life that it has happened. Susan, maybe, maybe we can ask you, um, coming from, from the perspective of, of, of communicating the science, right, over your career, kind of how that's changed, how you've seen your colleagues, or your messages, um, engaging with uh, the public about these things, because I think this is, you know, we journal journalists use tools to do mobilization and, and, and case studies and examples, and anecdotal leads are one way to do it. Uh, Right? What what have you seen across time? What's worked? Well, I, I tend to uh, agree with what Mira said. I mean, 
Uh, I take Tom's point that there's no one universal poster child for this issue, the same way that there was for some other issues. Um, so, you know, when you, when you look at the past, you can think about how straightforward it was to get people to start thinking about smog. You know, it was something you could see, you could smell it, you could taste it. It's clearly bad for children's health. You know, it's extremely bad right now for children's health in, in China and in uh, India. So there's, there's not much doubt that uh, it is a, a personal problem. It's a very perceptible problem. We need have practical solutions. So those are my three Ds about how we've solved uh, problems in the past. We do our best work when things are personal, perceptible, and practical way forward. I, I think we can be somewhat encouraged on this issue. I mean, despite Tom's <laughs> cynicism. Uh, you know, the, the issue is becoming more personal. It is certainly becoming more perceptible to people. The fact that summers are hotter in many parts of the world, it may not be obvious in Boston yet, but it's extremely obvious in the Caribbean, for example. The islands, particularly in the tropics, it's, uh, those are the places where you see the clearest signals. Um, I think the work of uh, people like Mira actually telling stories to people is powerful. So it's becoming more, more perceptible, it's becoming more personal, and the solutions, most importantly, are becoming actually quite practical. So the advances that have happened in clean energy and electric vehicle technology, you're going to see that continuing. And it's already going on at a breakneck pace in many other parts of the, of the world. I mean, there's not much doubt that China is investing heavily in those technologies. So um, these things are getting cheaper. They're competitive now. I think ultimately cost is probably going to be the practical side that will actually drive this. The cost of alternative technologies will, will come down to the point that, um, you know, the technologies that we have will be like the lucky way, you know, and that's, that's to some extent already true. So I think you'll, you'll see people making a change for a, a mix of reasons, just as they have on previous issues, and perhaps more slowly because it isn't as personal yet, and it's not as perceptible yet, and because, as Tom says, the people in the developed countries especially feel protected. They don't, they don't feel like it's a big threat to them yet. But as the people in North Carolina, how they feel. I mean, you know, that storm dumped more water than it would have in the absence of a climate change world. And uh, they're still dealing with the flood one. Okay, then if I could just chime in just a little bit, you said which, which intrigued me, and that's, um, and I don't want to be a some devil's advocate here, but um, the uh, solutions, the coverage of solutions, I think is one area that sort of, and, and this is not revolutionary, Think about, but I think coverage of, of emerging technologies and the people who are working on um, on solutions to this problem is sort of an undercovered area as, as journalism goes. Um, the doom and gloom can become a bit much, uh, and I think the people either they they start to tune it out, um, and uh, or, or they just you know they, they get this learned helplessness and they decide, well, we're all screwed, so why should I care? Um, and the other point that I wanted to make was one, one thing that we've done at Ondark, um, we're doing this very big series on air pollution, um, which really resonates with people and, uh, because we all breathe air and we all want clean air and we can all kind of understand that uh, particulate matter and air pollution can be extremely deadly in, a, in the span of a lifetime. Um, that's, that's the time span that we can understand. Um, and we never have to actually say that, by the way, when we clean this stuff up, it also happens to improve the battle against global warming. Um, and it's because it's resonating with people because of the reasons that it's Susan has titled. It's personal, um, it's, it's perceptible. Um, what was your other key? Practical. It's practical. There are things you can do. You can, you can put scrubbers on, on stacks in the developed world. We've done this. So, um, that's not to say that we don't cover uh, pollution, but I think that it's it's another avenue, um, and it's not really sort of a stalking horse for covering. We're, we're being deceptive. It's just this is actually a real problem. Uh, air pollution is, is killing millions of people around the world um, every year, and, and if you address that, you also happen to be addressing climate change in one way. So it's another way that we can sort of 
as a journalist, I think, cover this issue um, uh, without necessarily sort of repeating ourselves over and over again in the same tropes. I, I have a question. Um, part of the issue of, of pulling together what it is science knows and what policymakers do um, is that there is often pushback that suggests that the negative effects that we see in the, in the climate, flooding, whatever, are not necessarily caused by human action. And so there's a, a, a perceived break that takes place between uh, the bad result and the causes of that. And as writers, I, I have to wonder, how is it that you, how do we overcome that? How do we, in fact, use the data that's out there in a way that demonstrates causality so that people feel as though they're actually going to be affected by this? <laughs> that's, a, that's a key question. It's like, what role do we, does humanity play in this happen? I think I'd be better, like, seeing this Susan first on this question because I, I mean so if I could reiterate your question what there's skepticism over humanity's role in creating this issue it persists um, for, for a lot of reasons some of them do as a scientist what, what's your answer what, what can you say yeah that? it's a tough one I mean it, it's a very tough one I don't have a, a, an easy solution for this one um, Unlike a lot of other problems, this one is a change that is essentially statistical. And that's really hard for people to get their hands around. You know, the idea that we didn't have smog before, now we have smog. It's just not that complicated. Well, we did have hurricanes before. Now they're carrying more water. Um, can we prove that this was the wettest storm that ever would have happened? I, you know, you, you, you can't uh, look at a single storm. You have to look at the statistics of many storms. And statistics are just hard for people to get their hands around. Well, a lot of people have, have difficulty with that. I'm not sure why, to tell you the truth. I mean, you know, people understand things like gambling and odds of winning the lottery, so they have some sense of what. what statistics are, even if they don't really understand it in detail. But, you know, the fact that what it is when you look at climate change is a cranking up of the system rather than an entirely changed system, I think is actually very difficult for people to grasp. So one, one large American industry is the insurance industry. And insurance firms are the ones who are making payouts that clearly demonstrate uh, losses that are attributable to climate change. And if there's any industry in this country that's data-driven by actuaries and the like, it's the insurance industry. And so why is it that that industry is not at the forefront of, of, of advocacy? Could you talk to that, Dan? Well, I mean, yeah, the insurance companies have been the most industry in industry that has uh, sort of lobbied for climate policy for the last 10 or 15 years uh, because they saw that this was going to come out of their, out of their bottom line. Um, so it's, it's not hard to you know, find reports by uh, some of the major insurance companies around the world, particularly Nick Gray is one of the big ones, um, who have who've done multi-faceted uh, reports on uh, the science behind climate change, what impact this is going to have, what rising sea levels are going to mean in coastal communities, and how much that's going to cost, including the insurance payout. So, um, but, you know, you're putting the insurance industry's power up against the power of the oil industry. Um, who wins? You know, they, they, they've not been able to push the needle much either, although they've been an influential actor I think, in this discussion. And to the extent that we are where we are now in, in our discussions of this topic, you could probably give a certain amount of credit to the insurance industry, I think. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I haven't, I haven't followed that closely. I mean, I, I just um, finished a story about Cape Cod and how land prices are changing because of that. And I talked to, to insurance, thinking that same thing, you know, that these, these are the people who are 
really going to be paying for this. Um, but a lot of the costs are getting passed along, and uh, and people don't get insurance, especially for catastrophic events, very uh, very well. So they, if they can afford to pay, they pay. If they can't, they get out of the situation. Mm -hmm. And then when bad things hit, like going to West Virginia after a flood took out uh, eight houses in this tiny little town. Um, they just cobble together the, the resources to, to get going again. And oftentimes that meant building the exact same place where they were in danger. So um, insurance in that way is failing on the consumer level because it's just not translating to, to individuals. But to go back, Professor, to your question on the, on the journalism level is to just to really avoid alarmist language and to be really, really cautious. I think one, one, um, one thing we have to be very aware of is to just say, you know, even even getting that precise language that that a hurt, the hurricanes will still happen, the droughts have always happened. These, these events are not unusual, but how they are behaving fits with what this known science is about making, uh, you know, and, and trying to translate it that you know it's it's basic it's it's basic facts that you know warmer air holds more water. Therefore, more water can fall on your head when it rains. So, just trying to make it, you know, get down to the basics of, of things so that um, the science doesn't seem complicated. Yeah, there are literal, you know, newsroom trainings where they talk about that kind of use of, of language. Uh, just in, in, in uh, AD style books, can kind of these kinds of places where you can kind of push change to, you know, the the loudspeakers that are then talking public. And you know, to, to, to borrow an example from kind of the, the the law school here, you know, they they recently held a conference on uh, frame media frames around addiction and kind of pejorative framing uh, around using terms like addicts. And so what they have done is take it upon themselves as lawyers, as kind of health professionals, to go to media and talk to them about how better to talk about this. And I've mentioned AD so because they did change the way that they actually discuss. Um, addiction. So, could we be doing more of that on climate? But, but about this um, issue of kind of extreme weather attribution, there has been change in recent years uh, with more scientists, um, I guess, being better or, or feeling better um, about um, attributing a certain portion of that uh, storm to climate. Can Can you tell us a little more about that, Susan? Do you know? Much it's not my, it's it's not exactly what I do, but I mean I guess I'll say that I think an important point is that you can't uh, make the statement that all extreme events are going to get worse, and sometimes there's just too many sweeping generalizations. But people are actually going in every time an event happens and doing a specific analysis for that event's conditions. That that is something that can be done, and the outcome is a probability that there is a human impact or a some cases, a, a fraction of the effect that is um, almost certainly caused by human activity. So it's usually not that the entire event couldn't have happened, but it wouldn't have been as extreme. So the heat wave wouldn't have been as hot, the extreme heavy rainfall wouldn't have been as heavy, et cetera. Those are the kinds of things where a lot of progress is made. But on that point, I would say, because I've seen this, you know, the response from, from, from both sides on this is A, oh, uh, scientists are, are, are a little too trigger happy on attributing a specific storm. But And so what I'm trying to get at is how do we talk? Let's let's talk more about this kind of thing. The divisiveness here. Let's talk more about how people can seize on different interests, can seize on whether a study is not fully through peer review before <coughs> someone speaks to the media about a percentage of the storm's rainfall being attributed, attributable to climate change. Um, and in a similar way, how do we kind of seize, or how do folks seize the uncertainty inherent in science when they talk about probability um, and, and, and use it for their interests? Somebody else wants to crack at that? I mean, I, I'm not sure what the question is. Exactly. Yeah, I think I follow you. I think I follow you. I'll say two things. I think that uncertainty in, in 
science, climate science, any science is something that journalism is very bad at dealing with, and very bad at communicating. In some ways, that tends to be part of the problem. Um, because we, it ends up presenting this vacuum when we don't deal with it in, in practical ways and talk to people about uh, what we know and just as, just as much what we don't know, it leaves this vacuum that can be exploited by um, nefarious actors who, who, who also understand the uncertainty and can use that to kind of cast doubt. We, we see this all the time. We saw this tobacco, we see it with climate change. So I think that's one problem. And then, on the, you know, specifically on the attribution issue, I find this to be one of you know, one of many, you know, cul-de-sacs of, of the climate debate that is just useless. It's, it's, it's like, so what if the storm, like, was 10% attributable to human activity or 90% driven by, I mean, just, this is, this is like a little corner that tends to make people too out, I think, um, because it's, it's, uh, it's just intellectualizing on, on an issue that, uh, boils down to models and math, and uh, doesn't doesn't really matter in terms of people's everyday lives. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that's that's all I'm trying to that. I don't even know if that answers the question. I, I think it depends a lot on how personal the issue actually is. Um, you know, how much certainty people demand depends on the nature of the impact. You know, if you talk about smog in China uh, causing, say, 50 million more cases of asthma in children in Beijing, does it matter really if it's 50 million or only 20 million? You know, I mean, it's kids, right? Um, the, the same kind of thing happens when you talk about skin cancer and, and the ozone pollution. You know, people don't. Ask the question, you know, yes, it will cause more skin cancer. Do we have to know if it's 20 million or 10 million more cases? If it happens to you, you know, nobody wants the big C. So um, I, I really think it has everything to do with the nature of the impact that we get stuck in this rut of trying to, to deal with uncertainty. But, um, and it's true, everything will have uncertainty. Of course, it's, it's the, the, the cheapest way for someone who doesn't like something to attack it is to say, well, isn't this, is this absolutely certain? Of course, it isn't. Very few things are. Um, so it just exploits uh, an obvious uh, method that you can use. But it's not really a, a exploitable when the issue becomes personal. That's really what I want to say. Can I add, uh, I'm thinking, um, I'm thinking about one of the stories that I did was in North Dakota. So this is right on the border of Montana and Canada. So it's a it's an intense place. They have extreme weather all the time. It's northern North Dakota. And there was a sense of, um, you know, they're tough and they can handle that kind of thing. And they're proud of that. You know, they don't need anybody coming and saving them when they have bad weather or get their trucks stuck in a ditch or, they have a drought or they have floods, which they've, which they've always had. Um, so there's, I mean, in terms of understanding, again, that, that those cultural reasons of why people are, might be resistant to this. And, and so I met, you know, and this is again where working on the series was so fascinating because uh, I constantly was, was um, surprised at answers I was getting from people when I was asking questions. There were some, uh, some ranchers were like, "Yeah, I've been I've been watching, you know, like when the calves start, when calving season starts, how cold it is in the barn, how many times we bring the calves and the cows in when they're birthing because it's too cold. You know, I've been documenting that for 45 years, and it's I can just see that it's totally not warmer. Like, they, but they've been, you know, they've got a log book like this, but they've got like 50 of them, and they've been doing that, and they can see it. And then other ones are like, eh, it's, you know, it gets warm, it gets cold." There were glaciers here once. There were glaciers here again. Um, so you you know there's a whole range of it, but like thinking about why there is that complexity around it, I think is a really important part of the equation. Um, because there's these other factors at play. I think one one thing that that I've seen in, in my reporting, you know, the the more you the more you're paying attention to those folks. So so. Climate change raising to the fore inequities, right? Me being able to say, wait a minute, you know, when someone says to me, I don't work for an environmental agency, I work for a health agency at the EPA, right? 
And then I think, wait a minute, the whole frame of my story should just be about the health. Let me not get bogged down in a kind of boring, boring kind of exposition of environmental policy across a few decades, but rather just go to someone who's experiencing um, right, something because they were forced to build on that land again. They cannot scrape together three hundred dollars, right, to kind of get out of town, right? That's the, this, that was so crazy to see with this, the hurricane season. Just folks, you know, for those of us with the means to get out of town and get a hotel room for a night or a week or a month, right? That kind of stuff doesn't exist for other folks, and that's a climate story, right? But it's maybe not that kind of thing we think of when we think of, oh, New York Times had a climate change story, and it's glaciers and maps and lines with no uncertainty bars, uh, right? And, and, and those kinds of things. Um, that's more of a comment. Oh, are you going to bring up that? So yeah, so this, <laughs> so, uh, so the students um, around which this event and this class, the class was um, tasked with reading Nathaniel Rich's kind of long New York Times Magazine piece, um, running through decades and decades of you know, why didn't we act then next year? Why didn't we act then? Reagan gets elected. Why didn't we act then? Um, what would you like me to bring up? I, I actually, um, when, um, I actually wanted to hear from Dr. Yeah, Solomon about, because part of the, part of the, um, those of you who haven't read it, part of the framing of that is that when we discovered there was an ozone hole, which is how we think of it, we know that's not scientifically accurate, um, we all, Globally came together and dealt with it in, in a very fast order. And, and um, part of how Nathaniel Rich frames it is that climate change, you know, just going from global warming to climate change is a little nebulous, a little hard to put a finger on, was part of the reason why the world didn't react um, as quickly, but also that there's a lot of other factors at play. But I would love to, when you were sitting on this panel, I was hoping I could hear from that. Well, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to articulate all my thoughts uh, quickly, but, but let me just say that I think you raised exactly the right point in the case of the Montreal Protocol and the protection of the ozone layer. We had the Antarctic ozone layer. And even though you couldn't see it and smell it and taste it like you can smog, it was pretty obvious. You know, you didn't have to be a highly um, scientific person to look at the images to see the, the film clips of how it happens uh, to, to really quickly assimilate the reality of it. So I think that if we had a, and, and it was a focusing event, it really drew people's attention in a major way. I mean, it was something we didn't anticipate. It showed that your best scientific forecast can sometimes be conservative because we actually expected ozone depletion to be much less severe and much farther in the future, and all of a sudden we had this thing that nobody expected. I think people uh, can, can resonate with science better when you get surprised. People actually like it when scientists get surprised, then uh, they get intrigued. And um, it, it created uh, a rapidity of thinking around the issue that never would have been there if the ozone depletion had unrolled in the slow way that we thought that it would. We're very good at dealing with crises. We're good at dealing with quick problems. Look at the things that were done to contain the Ebola. But when you when you look at, at, at something that happens very slowly, it's always a tomorrow problem. So I don't think there's much mystery around. And then again, we had practical solutions. There, very simple fact that in this country, we got rid of the chlorofluorocarbons, which caused the ozone hole in, uh, in spray cans in the 1970s. But in Europe, they kept on using them until after the ozone hole was discovered, actually, in most countries. So all they really had to do was give up, you know, air spray and under deodorant that, that had chlorofluorocarbons in them and switch to the products that we have that already are non chlorofluorocarbon uh, contained. So you don't even have to give up your hairspray. You just have to change the, 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 the style of what's inside the thing. So um, it, it was a very practical thing to fix. It didn't cost that much. It wasn't, and again, I think a, a key point about uh, ozone was that 
you were dealing with an industry that actually is a technological industry. The lifeblood of the chemical industry is making new chemicals. They love to make new chemicals. So, you know, I don't really think it's the case that the U.S. companies were ahead. I just think that's an industry that loves a technological challenge. They, they're always trying to make a better plastic or what have you. Uh, you don't have the same thing going on in the fossil fuel industry. Um, you know, to, to a large extent, they have a massive mineral resource, and they intend to use that resource. It's a lot of money. It's a big asset. So a very, very different type of industry. I could go on and on all night. Uh, the only other thing I'm going to say is that the chemical industry had been regulated before. So this wasn't new to them. You know, they had the same issue come up with pesticides and DDT and, and other um, you know, dangerous pesticides that were clearly causing damage to nature, if not to human beings. So they, they uh, have a very, very different approach to, to change. I think those are the key points. So the CFC's um, solution is interesting because there was a readily available or a new chemical that we spun up quickly, quickly enough. And I think at least in the media, we pay attention to these kind of cure-all mandates to climate change, which would be things like geoengineering our way out of this issue, right? And I'm sorry to, to, to bring up that point, but it's it, I, I wrote a story recently about how it was dangerous to rely on something that still isn't even out there, right? But there's some interesting research done at the highest levels about how this might be a way to either suck out carbon or maintain temperatures or something like that. Um, but it's not there, right? The CFC replacement was there. Which is what makes the, <clears throat> the ozone analogy, in my mind, always a problematic one. When we're talking about climate change, these are problems um, and solutions that, in a, that, as it relates to scale, are so different. So, so wildly different um, as to almost be meaningless. And I think it also leads us down this sort of path to think, which, which I think in part is what Nathaniel's piece did, unfortunately, it was to kind of uh, reinforce this idea that um, somehow we were able to rally to solve those things that we just came up with a similar problem like climate change, which is not, which is not really uh, the case. I mean, Switching out from, from the CFCs that were causing the problem was a relatively minor adjustment compared to uh, getting off of the fossil fuels. Let's just start with oil. We're wearing oil, we're driving on oil. It's, it's just so much more pervasive in how we have come to live these prosperous lives that we're living. Um, how do you want to do that um, on a dime or in a decade or in a century? And, and so I think that. You know, that, that analogy always strikes me as somewhat problematic. I mean, I'm sure you can speak to that better than I can, but um, I wonder if you sometimes think so, or what is it useful? Yeah, um, I, I think it's useful to think about, but I agree with you that it isn't uh, uh, something to invoke that says, well, we did it for ozone, we can obviously do it for climate. Um, because you're right, we can't we can't change on a dime. When it comes to uh, even switching out your refrigerator to a different refrigerator, right? you know you're you're not going to keep your refrigerator probably for more than ten years. And if you buy a new one, so you can keep the one you have, but you know when it breaks, you buy a new one that has a different compound in it that's not causing damage to the ozone layer the way the fluorocarbon refrigerants did. Um, you know, it's going to cost you another fifty dollars probably for that. Well, you know, it's a bigger decision. Do I get the crushed ice or the cubed ice? The ice maker, right? Um, or the size of the refrigerator. So it's a very small delta on the cost of a big refrigerator. And you know, similarly with uh, when you talk about the type of investments we have for climate change, you know, we're going to keep a power plant for fifty years. We're going to keep our homes. I mean, I live in a hundred-year-old house, so. We have a commitment to continuing to emit that's entirely different. Our entire infrastructure is oriented around fossil fuels. But I think it's worth thinking about what would represent a focusing event in the climate change issue. And you know, I'll just give you one example. Let's say a great big chunk of Greenland fell into the sea. That is not impossible. I mean, a big enough chunk. It's not likely. I, I don't think it's going to happen. But let's say it happened within a few years. 
you would, you would see mass and you could see really big sea level rise, you know, you could see half a foot yeah. that that would that would definitely get people's attention because it would be all around the world it would be you know distributed enough it would just be in one region do you think people would stop driving no Drilling but i think the impetus the impetus to do something about climate change would change i imagine like those alien movies where the ufos show up and you know and over every continent <laughs> we're forced to join forces but but Susan, you've been you know architecting a lot of the language that is presented to policymakers, and they almost just need to push it over the, the finish line. And it must be so frustrating, right? No, actually, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> really? No, it, it isn't. I, I honestly, you know, maybe I'm just I'm really always an optimist, and for me, the the glass is always half full. I really think that the way that people have um, understood the problem. In the last five or so years, says, well, great and, and, and phenomenal. Very, very impressive. <laughs> so the level of public understanding is spreading in a way that, uh, that is pretty much unstoppable. I mean, if you look at the polls of people's views on it, most people understand that global warming is, is genuine. Um, most people will also say it's not an immediate problem. And the, where the breakdown actually happens, I think is that most people, unfortunately, believe the solutions are impractical. I actually think that that's where journalism could have its biggest impact, would be actually showing people how practical the solutions are. And, and how economical, which is this point I was trying to make before, is this sort of, we're, we're missing an opportunity to really kind of drill down to journalists, I think, on, on solutions that are being worked out, um, and solutions that already exist. Uh, to this problem, and not just talking about them as sort of pie in the sky, technological daring do, uh, but um, also as uh, business options. I mean, this this is a way of also capturing an audience that may be skeptical about doing something simply because it's the right thing to do, or because you know the Greenland is going to fall off in the sea. They don't it, but um, you know, tell them they might make a buy if they invest in something. Um, then they start to. And, you know, it, it won't be gratifying because even if you get all those viewpoints lined up, it's still going to take many years to, to really solve the problem. So it has to be in, in terms of an investment in our long-term future, which we're extremely bad at. But, but let's tackle that problem next. You know, first we have to actually understand that we could do it, that we should do it. And, and then go ahead and figure out how long it's going to take to do it. And those things can come together. Again, like one of these inside climate news stories from you know, West Texas, and that was like an area that was incredible oil and gas industry there. And I ended up focusing on um, students who were at the Texas Tech, um, the Technical College there, and they were getting certified as wind turbine technicians. And this is an area that is huge. Some of the world's largest wind farms are in this area. It's, it's um, Kind of spectacular to, to see see this area in transition, but also they're still doing tons of oil and gas. Uh, 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 there's tons of extraction happening there, side by side with cattle ranching and cotton farming and wind turbines. Um, and so I was basically asking these students, like, why are you going into this industry? And some of them had been in uh, had been in fracking, and they're just like, good God, it's just boom and bust. You just get laid off. You know, you're going to get laid off again in two years. The work is really hard. It's really dangerous. Um, one of the guys I met, his uh, father had um, worked in the oil fields and basically made his son promise when he turned 18 that he would never work in the oil fields. The father had, had multiple injuries and he was just like, you swear to me, we'll not go do this work. And uh, and he didn't. And he, you know, he's, he's working as a, um, as a wind turbine technician and now he's teaching at the college. But it's, you know, they were looking for just stability. Like they were... 19 year old kids who are just like, I just want a stable job. And and also in terms of a job, I'd rather like go up, you know, and be like flying in the clouds rather than underground or um, working around explosives. They were totally fine with the, the still dangerous work. There's still risk of, you know, dropping big instruments at 300 feet or getting electrocuted. Like there's still total risk. Um, and to, uh, two of the two of the students that um, I met were veterans and it totally fit with their their skills and background, 
um, that they had autonomy, flexibility, and they could use their smarts to like figure out these situations. Like there was all these things which is positive. And the fact that this was Texas, they had created the infrastructure to go back to that practical part of it. Um, you know, under under a total Republican administration, and that's a big part of making renewables work, is that you need this like grid technology and infrastructure that supports supports it. And they just did it, and they did it like that because they had full support from industry and the government, Republican government, to make it all happen. And you know, they get some days they get like thirty to fifty percent of their power from wind generators in Texas. Like they, and it's not a place that you think of as like. And it's, cost competitive. and it's cost competitive, yeah. And so there is, there, you know, those are the examples that may be less than important. Um, that the business opportunities are there, that people are doing it. And those those kids weren't going in because they were concerned about climate change, not thinking about it. Some acknowledged that it was happening, some totally didn't. But yeah, I mean, I think the policy wedge is is a really important part. Um, and, and if you don't absent that, uh, you know, this leading into market forces. Is, you know, it's a losing game and in, in many ways because even though I think it's important to appreciate for is despite all the fantastic technology that's being developed uh, the very practical stuff that's available it's competing against some stuff that's pretty miraculous right I mean a, a, a little cup of gasoline the amount of energy that's bound up in that little cup of, of, of liquid um, is, is it's miraculous when you think about it and so this is what this is the problem we're up against. It's lightweight. You can kind of put it in the car. It will take us for miles and miles and miles to do something comparable with electric cars. Um, it's, 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 it's more complicated, and, and it's getting better. And uh, it will only get better if we invest and, and, and create the policies that will nudge that technology forward. But it is up against a very formidable um, uh, incumbent technology that's uh, it's, it's sort of like magic. I mean, I always kind of come down to, to that and just... Yeah, but the fossil yeah. fuel industry is incredibly subsidized. Yeah. I can't remember what the... I have no, a deal when I was working with the book. It's like $600 so. million dollars a day or a minute, or it's just yeah. insane how much it's subsidized. And that's not There's no question. That's yeah. not acknowledged in talking about what, what the market can do. Yeah, yeah. In, in uh, Boston, uh, this past week, there have been two big announcements. Uh, about energy use and uh, resilience. One uh, took place at the Chamber of Commerce breakfast a week ago, uh, where the mayor announced a series of uh, physical infrastructure plans, uh, the creation of 67 uh, acres of uh, new land along the waterfront, for example, and collaborative work with uh, GE and Gillette uh, to uh, uh, address issues on the Fort Point Channel and uh, uh, building new parkland with Massport in uh, East Boston and building out on the piers uh, in, uh, in downtown to uh, protect some of the infrastructure. And then on Sunday, uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies announced that Boston would be one of four cities to get a major grant nationally to address uh, things like traffic calming and increasing the use of uh, EVs, uh, electronic vehicles, and uh, a range of other things. Could you comment on, on those kinds of interventions and also on the kinds of other uh, tools that are uh, now being applied to, uh, to address these issues, uh, primarily by mayors and the like, we'd see, but, but otherwise? Um, yeah, I mean, that, that part has been kind of fascinating to watch how, um, I mean, just have that, my, my book about India came out um, right when Modi was elected there, and uh, it was just, it was just interesting watching how when, when Trump came into power here and pulled out of Paris, like, there was this huge vacuum, and it really did feel like, you know, every, every nation wants to be proud of what it's doing in some respect, you know, like so that there's, there in a sense, America dominating the climate conversation on some ways because we are, we are the biggest emitter, there, that there was, oh, China has that piece, okay, so, but we're, so we're, we're one of them, <laughs> but we are, uh, 
something something seemed to shift that China and India sort of were able to step up and say we're going to act on this and really move forward with renewables and trying to to um, decarbonize. There's huge huge caveats to that. There's still massive building of coal fired power plants, etc. etc. But there seem to be in terms of just like the the political space of just stepping into that. And it seems like on the local level, state, states and, and cities as well in the U.S. We seem to be stepping into that vacuum that was created by the huge sucking sound that happened when Trump wanted to come out um, acting on the U.S. national level. Um, that sometimes gives me hope that there there is room for that because because China and India especially are such huge huge players in this equation, um, and what's happening there is really key. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think the actions of the state and local level have, for a long time, been driving, uh, particularly in this country, have been driving this sort of spearheading um, any advances that we've made on any of these green initiatives and you know, climate change. Um, for, in part because, you know, it's, it's always good luck at the federal level. Um, you know, in states like California, for instance, have positioned themselves in direct opposition to what the Trump administration is doing. Do the level S to try to make it very complicated uh, for the, the repeals that he's making to stick. Um, and, and, you know, maybe we can be thankful that states have that power. But I, I really think that, you know, those sorts of local initiatives, um, those are really going to be the driving point for the years to come. Yeah, the, the, the one uh, federal piece that I am aware of is. Uh, something called the Qualified Opportunity Zones Package, which was part of the uh, 2017 uh, tax cut. Uh, and interestingly, uh, Cory Booker and Tim Scott, uh, two African American senators, uh, managed to get placed in that uh, tax cut legislation uh, a provision that uh, enables investors to defer. Uh, capital gains on some of their investments if they also put money into resilient infrastructure investments in areas uh, that would be considered low-income areas. And the IRS uh, issued its first set of regs concerning that uh, just this past Friday. I know that there are some folks here at Northeastern who are um, working on uh, conceptualizing um, how uh, that uh, element of the, of the tax cut might actually be used for positive purposes. And the fact that uh, it was proposed by Booker um, and by Scott, um, I find particularly interesting, but uh, almost no one's talking about it yet because the IRS rules have just come out on it. Well, that reminds me of the kind of local part that, that people could play. I mean, I, my landlady is actually amazingly engaged at the issues in, in Cambridge, and uh, particularly for those that know the geography here, the Alewife um, floodplain, right? And how there's a lot of development occurring right there near way in on two. But that's something, and maybe these economic opportunity zones is going to be an opportunity for you know locals, specifically communities that are going to be trying to get roped into this. Actually, have a say on like what that resilient infrastructure looks like, right? Because that could mean things like, um, oh, there's going to be educational opportunities for those communities. It could also mean half of it's going to be marshland because we need to buffer the next storm surge. So that's you know you know you always wonder like, oh, well, how do I kind of switch out my light bulb or something more energy efficient? What is the kind of climate action <coughs> angle? There are people working on it, right? And 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 we should be finding these. You know, maybe it's not a policy bridge. But it's a it's a local issue wedge, but of course, and I'll, I'll open this up pretty soon. Um, of course, there is this oncoming tide, which is all of these other economies coming online, mostly fueled by fossil fuels, and so it is going to have to still be this kind of this this international um, kumbaya that we're at one point going to have to have, right? And so, <laughs> with that, unless everyone has anything to say to the kumbaya comment. Um, I will open it up to questions from the audience. Yeah. 
club. Um, I really appreciate the work you're doing. Um, but one thing, when I look at um, the media, they, they talk about almost everything in terms of the economy, any change, any building, any new taxes or um, price increases, all that kind of thing. And I'd like to see um, climate change come into the conversation as constantly. Like they'll talk about raising prices on the tea and you know, you get a lot of blowback if you're talking about raising gas prices, but no one sort of draws those um, mixed comparisons or you know ties those issues together. And I'm wondering if you see any of that, any way for that to start to happen. Is that is that a fair question? I mean, I know this comes, and this has definitely come up amid journalists and at conferences about how much to be, um, how how many times can you reference it? Is it every opportunity that you possibly can or not? You know, like there's all these, so that it's, it's there's a lively debate going on among journalists, and I'm sure about editors as, as well, among editors um, about about that exact question. I'm, I'm a member um, of the Society of Environmental Journalists, and we've been talking a lot about how to be reaching out as a Society of Environmental Journalists to, to be reaching out to the business reporters, the health reporters, just like going to Susan's point about the human health implications of climate change. So how to reach, uh, have a lot more cross-pollination happening between people who are on different beats. So it's not just quote unquote environment or science reporters who are even covering this issue, but that because it's like I said in my opening earlier statement, you know, it's, it's infusing every aspect of life really. I mean, it's an economic issue, it's a health issue, it's a industry issue, it's an agriculture issue. So all these all these um, things are coming together and and we're debating it and I think it's just kind of an ongoing process. Um, you can say more than that, or... No, I mean, I, I just while you were talking about that, I was thinking about so my, my the latter part of my time at the New York Times. I, I went back to the New York Times after leaving once to go to National Geographic around 2007. I went back to the Times or 2008. So it was, it was as everything was ramping up for the, um, the Copenhagen climate conference at that time, and New York Times was launching a, uh, uh, several new verticals, um, as they call them. Verticals um, dedicated to climate and, and dedicated to green business, um, and they hired a whole suite of new reporters on came back to, to edit this particular the, the green business um, silo. And it lasted about um, two years. It lasted through the Copenhagen conference, um, and then a year or so after it ended, they killed it. And they also killed the environment desk that they had formed at the time. Um, too much outrage in the environmental community and. And Dean McKay, I think uh, the, the editor at the time, said that uh, uh, we will continue to cover the environment, but we decided and understood that um, this was an issue that, that crossed all the desks. We didn't need to have a dedicated desk for this issue. Well, fast forward to 2018, and they've doubled down on having a climate desk. They've essentially they recreated an environmental desk and changed their minds and said we actually do need someone, uh, some group of journalists to cover these issues relentlessly over and over again from a variety of perspectives. So they do have a business, um, a, a person who specializes in business on the climate desk. And they do have several science journals to deal with the science on the climate desk. Um, and so I guess in some ways the answer to your question is the media is kind of feeling its way clumsily through this issue too. Um, and, and I think that um, part of the problem is, you know, how often can we draw these connections uh, without sort of becoming a, a drone sound in people's minds. Um, and I think that's the challenge. But I think it's going in the right direction, actually. Thank you. Who, at a national level, do you see as a bright, shining star politically regarding the environment? I think of somebody like Al Gore. Um, especially with the deregulation stuff that I see the Trump administration taking on. And it's, uh, I don't see a big pushback 
pro environment coming from legislators at the national level. Do you have any observations on any of that? <laughs> President Obama. <laughs> Actually, he did do a lot when he was there. Um, I, I, I wish that uh, I could name somebody that I think is, uh, is, is, has got any potential to, to do what you're talking about. I, no name comes to me. I mean, I, I think those actors. Uh, I think those actors are going to be found at the state and local level. I mean, I, I'm really not sure. Um, gosh, I'm racking my brain. If I think of one person at the federal level that I think is a bright, shining star, um, and and I can't. No, I don't know one. I, I think there are several at the local and state level um, who are um, they're they're at least holding ground. Against what the Trump administration is doing, but I don't know anyone. Yeah, I I wish I could think of a name as well, but um, um, I would one of the stories I don't know if one can break break up the intestine, but one of the other, one of the last stories that's um, going to be coming out soon is was uh, young evangelicals who are concerned about climate action. So I was at Wheaton College in in, um, um, in outside of Chicago and. Uh, I was there at the same time as Bob Inglis. So he was a South Carolina congressman who became very vocal about taking climate action. He is very pro carbon tax, wants to just like level the whole playing play field in that way. Um, and he he lost by 80, you know, <laughs> 82 percent or something like that. And he just lost in a landslide by taking that position into primaries. And that is what is happening, is that any um, voices on the right who are speaking out on this issue is being used as a sword to stab them in the back. So that is a huge, um, huge conundrum. But when I was when I was working on that story and digging into a lot of the research, there's a, um, so he is part of an organization called Republic EN, as in Re Republic Environment. And uh, um, Alex Bosmaski is I think the managing director or something of that organization, and he. He did the numbers, and it was something like, you know, only like if 5,000 conservative Americans wrote to their congressmen and women and said that they were concerned about climate, that that could be enough to move the needle. Like they just need to, they just don't feel like they can step out on the issue uh, because that sword will appear <laughs> out of the clouds and they will be done. But if there's a, if there's any and, and you know I mean some of these stories were taking were very conservative and did care Montana fly fishermen who don't get to fish because the rivers are closed because they're too warm there are people who are Teddy Roosevelt conservatives who want to see action and so like you know that engagement could shift something it could yeah I mean I've been having the same conversation with Bob Inglis for ten years so it's the scary thing. Um, and the one thing that did occur to me too, though, is we should uh, remember the attorneys general um, around the country who also made the powerful actors. Barbara Underwood in New York just sued Exxon after a long uh, investigation. I think today uh, the lawsuit was filed, um, charging them with defrauding investors on this specific issue. Um, and so people like her, uh, I think, are also change agents uh, who could be quite powerful, although we now have a stack of the Supreme Court. So we won't know how far it will go. No, I guess uh, I'm waiting for Michael Moore to, to uh, declare his candidacy for the presidency. Um, I have a question um, related to what you were just talking about. So this past weekend, I actually was at a conference where I was simulating a conference of mayors. Um, and we were talking about climate change, and it, it brought a very unique perspective to me that I've never really considered on the issue. Um, and kind of looking at it as the federal government kind of lacks this central narrative or has a very um, different narrative than scientists do about climate change. Um, I was wondering how do the actions on the city and state level, such as like the We Are Still in Movement with the Paris Climate Accord, that a lot of businesses and cities have signed on to, um, as well as um, other similar things affect the results that we're seeing. And is this creating kind of a disjointed response to climate change? And also, like, how is that affecting how it's reported? Because to me, it seems like a lot of people hear 
a federal narrative on climate change and sometimes are lacking um, the local narrative that, that their own mayor or their own state government is, is putting forward because the voice of the federal government is so loud. Um, so I was just kind of wondering how that affects the understanding of our community in general and, and how that's affecting the way that we're addressing the issue as a whole. I think that's a really great point. It's a really great point because local newsrooms are embedded. People are not necessarily trained in the um, trained in how to cover these issues. I, I think that's a really, really good point. I, I've been to a couple um, workshops with that, that Climate Matters has been hosting, and they're um, working at George Mason University, actually related to the Bob and Ghost Republican um, organization. And they're just they're, they're basically trying to train local newsrooms. Like I went down and talked about the Georgia Peach story to people in South Carolina who were coming from all the local places and just like talking about how do how you cover this beat that they are not um, formally trained in. They're probably covering everything that's happening in their community. How are they going to know this? And there are a lot of resources available to help those reporters. And I think the places like Climate Matters are just trying to let people know that they're available. They're actually doing a lot of stuff with, um, a lot of work with meteorologists and, and weather people because people, many people watch the evening news, they watch they and trust the, the people that they see up there telling them the weather and they're basically helping those meteorologists bring climate into those stories so that they can start seeing how that attribution science fits in and how what you're seeing, um, oh, you know, like the, one of their favorite graphics that they show is like, you know what's going to get worse with global warming? Poison ivy. Loves it. Loves the high carbon dioxide <laughs> environment. Roses, you know, they have all these graphs that they make that the local stations can use. And so um, I, there's efforts for that, but I think you're really on it that, that that's a missing part of the story that's not being covered really enough. Yeah, the other thing you have to keep in mind is that local mayors and the like. Uh, almost have no choice in particular areas uh, but to uh, address climate change uh, repercussions in, in very aggressive ways. You take a city like uh, Charleston, uh, where I commuted to a, a few years ago, um, it used to be that the peninsula on which Charleston is located would flood maybe three or four times a year. Now it's flooding once a month. And um, that cuts off the hospitals and the tech firms and government from uh, where people are living. And so uh, the mayors Riley and Pecklenburg in, in succession have had to make the investment in uh, stormwater control and flood control uh, in, in, a, in a very uh, prioritized way because the uh, impacts on uh, employment um, and tourism and a range of other things would be huge if they don't make those kinds of investments. And I'm certain that part of the reason that Mayor Walsh is um, uh, uh, making and negotiating investments here is that, uh, you know, if Sandy had hit here uh, rather than in New York, Logan Airport would have been underwater for days and that would have cut off the supply of food and pharmaceuticals and, and all kinds of commerce for all of New England, not just for Boston. Um, and, and so the investment has to be made just to protect uh, regional commerce. Um, and certainly you're seeing that not only in New Orleans, but you know in, in Roanoke and, and uh, uh, Miami and Savannah and a range of other coastal cities um, that have to act uh, less five years from now, they find themselves uh, crippled by the you know the vagaries of of, uh, of nature. <clears throat> you, you, you put my mind back to what we were talking about earlier, which is you know what are what are aspects of this problem that we don't cover enough, and I think adaptation and resilience uh, building is, is one of them. When I when I first started reporting on this issue. 15 years ago, it was almost considered verboten to talk about adaptation and resilience because it's like, well, no, we have to solve the problem to mitigate uh, emissions in the first place. But we, you know, we're not doing that, not at a pace that matters. Um, but for communities um, at the local level, the, the seas will still rise, uh, the storms will still get worse. And 
uh, it, it makes a lot of sense to spend some journalistic resources and paying attention to what's being done at the local level, how is money being spent in order to shore up um, shorelines and to, to uh, reinforce uh, seawalls. And, um, and if, if they're not spending money on that, why not? Um, and so yeah, that's that's one thing that one point I want to make. I also thought that your your question, I think you had a question about whether this um, creates a disjointed approach, um, which was interesting to me. I mean, I hadn't thought about it that way, but you know, my first reaction was, well, what's the option? I mean, it's 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 got to happen somewhere, and it's it's going to be piecemeal until it becomes until it weaves into something larger that looks like a cohesive uh, approach. Um, but it is possible that maybe as journalists we could do a better job um, of, of making a, a wider readership aware of things that are happening, not necessarily in their community, although that's important, but in other communities like them, all around, uh, all around the country and all around the world. Um, I don't think that we do that yeah. as well as we should, probably. Yeah. I mean, as we just said, here it's all sea level rise, yeah. and in the southwest it's all fire. You know, it would be actually very interesting to see an article that draw, draws all that together and talks about the actual costs of all that adaptation of these levels. You know, it's not cheap. It's funny that we'll have to be spent sooner. No, not that. <laughs> mitigate it a bit more. Yeah, and you know, and, and, and there are upstate effects as well. I mean, we tend to think of, of uh, uh, climate impacts as of water coming in from the ocean, but uh, part of the reason that South Carolina was interested in uh, making investments in resilience was that when major storms went inland, uh, they got as far as uh, Charlotte and uh, uh, Columbia, South Carolina, which are, are pretty far inland. And then all that water had to return to the sea. And in, in the act of uh, returning to the ocean, uh, hundreds of dams burst because they weren't uh, ready for uh, that kind of load. And it wasn't until the dams first that the state realized that it had no inventory of how many dams there were in the state, because many of them had been built by individual farmers or you know a little co-op or something like that. And so the state had no idea what the magnitude of trying to fix its dams were because there were thousands but no one knew, uh, and, and nor was there a state agency that was that was mandated to know how many dams there were. And uh, the same thing happened uh, up in Vermont when the storm uh, went well inland, and then the water coming back uh, once again did more damage coming back than, than uh, coming in. So, you know, the, the local efforts uh, are going to happen. Uh, because people realize uh, that in a local way that they're going to get impacted and if they're going to make a capital investment, they're going to try to make that capital investment in something that's going to have uh, long-term benefits. Hey, uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Um, my question addresses, I guess, something that we haven't specifically touched on, which is, I guess, the disconnect between being able to act as an individual and uh, having the industries uh, change their their ways because in reality they're really the ones that do the majority of the pollution. So my question is specifically, I guess, relating, for example, to the coastal aeration. Was it the consumers that started boycotting the CFC containing uh, products, or was it the industry itself that changed? And was that you know what made the change successful? And how does that you know relate to us? Should we be spending more effort trying to Individual change in our lifestyles, or should we be trying to hold industries accountable and affecting change policy or activism or you know whatever medium we can? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, in the case of the chlorofluorocarbons in the mid 70s, it actually was consumer action initially. So um, people made the choice not to use uh, literally not to use spray under our deodorant to, to switch to the roll on instead. I mean, how hard is that? You have to be a Cretan not to do it, right? And yet, um, you know, in Europe, it didn't happen, which is really interesting. But but in this country, 
There was a very organized consumer boycott of spray cans. There was also consumer action against styrofoam. You may remember the boycotts of actually McDonald's because of styrofoam containers, so they switched to the cardboard ones. You see the same thing happening now with actions trying to motivate industry to change their ways on things like straws, plastic straws, use paper straws instead, which when I was a kid were perfectly fine. And it's quite a few other people in this room if you remember those days when all the straws were paper back in cardboard. Um, but you know, these things are really important on certain types of issues. The reason that the spray can boycott was so effective is that at that time 75% of the global use of chlorofluorocarbons was in spray cans. So it was really firmly in consumer control. And furthermore, we had no big infrastructure investment in it. You know, how much, in those days, probably a, a can of uh, underarm urine cost you 75 cents. Well, you know, you could just throw it away. Or you could even use it and not buy another one. You know, buy the row one next time. So um, it, it, it was uh, an easy thing for people to do. And it really kicked the legs out from under that industry. You know, suddenly 75% of the market in the United States was gone. Um, so we still used them in refrigerators and air conditioners for a long time, but their you know, substitutes were found quickly because the industry at that point had a product that was not very profitable. You know, all of a sudden a big chunk of the market was evaporated. So the problem with, with uh, climate change is that we don't have individual actions that we can do that have that kind of effect. We do have one. Yeah, we love it. Yeah, we can do that. That's a good lifestyle. There's a lot of little things we can do. Uh, that will, uh, yeah, yeah, both is definitely important. But, this but look is, at the, I mean, this is the look at these bottles up here. Notice that you're the only one drinking that. No, <laughs> <laughs> You know, Mira and I brought our own. And the fresh ones, you can even use it. Oh my gosh. No, this is it. This is half a percent of our national carbon footprint right here. Right. Is that stupid? I mean, it's only half a percent, but it's a really stupid half a percent. We have perfectly potable water in this nation. We don't need these. And, uh, you know, but, but there's not a lot of things that, uh, other than voting, which I completely agree with you on, um, the individual can can, can do. You can buy, you, know, you can hang your, your clothes out on the line. That's a good thing instead of putting the dryer. You can buy more energy efficient appliances the next time you go shopping. That's extremely important. 15% of your household carbon footprint is, is actually your refrigerator, your home refrigerator. Uh, you can turn off your power strips. You can put everything on power strips instead of letting it plug in. Yeah, you know all this. It's, it's a, it's, but all those things are small compared to the size of the industry. You don't have this enormous lever that we had to see. Of the recent uh, predictions uh, uh, saying that the 2100 uh, <coughs> flooding that was going to occur in Boston is now predicted at 2040, it's almost in my lifetime. The, uh, is it time for me to sell my waterfront property <laughs> and move in land? <laughs> where is it? Yeah, where is downtown it? Downtown Boston? Oh, I think downtown Boston will be protected. Thank you. The mayor is already on it. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I have a water from home too. I'm fortunate in that. Uh, I picked it carefully to make sure it was high enough. I think it's okay. But but you're right. It's the price you pay. You know, but realistically, people in Boston are nowhere near as vulnerable as people in many other parts of the world. The people you really ought to be worrying about is if it's a problem for you in Boston, think of the problem that it is for coastal cities in the developing world. Because they have zero chance of any level of adaptation and resilience under the current system. I don't know. Please answer. Question. Um, so I think that you guys are all doing great work, and I think um, publications in general have covered climate change in a great way. But I feel like people who are reading on Dark Magazine or National Geographic or the New York Times don't necessarily need to be convinced of climate change. So I think how as journalists or scientists do you think you can reach out to people who don't read the newspaper every day and who really like aren't going to be reading these stories or watching this news? 
Uh, I think that's a really good point. We, we tried to do that with the Inside Climate News Series. We've been having partners for, I think we've successfully done it for maybe half of the story. So the West Virginia floods went to West Virginia on the broadcasting for the Georgia Peach story. We teamed up with the Atlanta Journal Constitution. So that was a great like Sunday newsprint story for a pretty conservative. I mean, uh, the hope with all of them is that we were going to partner with publications that were going to get to to the audience, um, uh, so that you know, you, like the evangelical story, we could create Christianity today, but they, they didn't go for it. But um, so <laughs> there has been an attempt to do that. One thing that was interesting though is after I had been I came back to New York to. There was like the 10 year anniversary for Inside Climate News. So I was in a room about this size, probably full house. Um, nobody in that room questioned climate change. And they were all reading Undark and Inside Climate News and, <laughs> and these publications. And I was kind of amazed at how many people came up to me saying, okay, so the very short story, West Virginia flood story. I went down to this little tiny town uh, that had been wiped out by this flood. Like literally, a little tiny creek had just gone blocks because of the super heavy precipitation event that aligns with climate change models, although can't be directly attributed to it. Um, and I went down there like, oh, so are you building new, uh, new building codes? Or, you know, that was my like, question going into it. And what I heard from a lot of people was like a strong evangelical town. And they're just like, you know, this like, oh, the fires that are burning the West right now, and the floods, like, this all fits. This is exactly what the, the megachurch that's growing really quickly down the road, like that's what I'm hearing. Like it fit with their narrative, like it fit with their story. They did the only action that they thought needed to happen was that they needed to get right with God and help other people do the same. So it turned into a totally different story. And I was amazed when I walked into New York that people were like, wow, I had no idea that some people like that, that, that this is a narrative that like fits other narratives that they have in their lives. And so I realized that actually some of the stories need to be heard on both sides, you know, because both sides are so entrenched in our, in in what we believe that if there's so little conversation um, between both sides. So I think yeah, I'll get off my soapbox. My narrative is a little bit different on my mental model, I guess. It's a little bit different. It seems to me that there are two different issues that we're complaining. One is the problems that are likely to occur um, in the lifetime of people who are alive now, and particularly in the very short term, like the Mayor Walsh stuff and, 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 and so forth. But then there are the problems that aren't going to occur in my lifetime, or my kids' lifetimes, or their kids' lifetime, that are going to occur, and we know about it. And there, my metamodel is we have to do something about people's view of how much they're giving to themselves versus how much they're giving to their kids, and versus how much they're giving to their grandkids. And I don't see you talking about that last. I mean, is that is there a question there? Yeah. Um, you know, okay. I mean, I, that's that's a, sort of to the point that Ian was trying to make in, in this film, right? Is that you know, if you, if you take a strictly economic sort of perspective on this problem, um, the the value of doing anything becomes zero 7,500 years out because I'm dead, so it doesn't matter. Um, we we try, I think, um, I think science communicators and and not even science journalists, you know. Um, try to do what you did, which is to make the connection to your own children or your, your children's cho children, which is personalizing the problem. What are you bequeathing to them? Um, but it does become a, it's, it's a temporal problem. Um, and at some point, you know, I, and I'm not sure that we ever will get there, but at some point you always do end up with what's our moral obligation to the generations that come after us. And on that question, you're always going to get a real diverse set of answers. Some of us will feel very powerfully that we, we owe a certain amount of action um, to, to the people who are going to inherit this world um, from us. Um, for other people, this is not, I mean, I don't think I'm saying anything unusual in saying for a lot of people, that does not matter at all. Um, and this is part of why we're sitting here where we are now. 
That's not really an answer, but it's a, it's a Well, I, I would just add, you know, most of us are not wealthy. But that doesn't mean that we don't contribute to a long-term legacy, even if we're not thinking about, for example, our own kids. Uh, the people a century and a half ago who decided to uh, support the creation of the Emerald Necklace or Central Park in the middle of New York, very valuable real estate, or Prospect Park in the middle of, of Brooklyn, or any of our other open spaces, were publicly spirited individuals, and they weren't all wealthy people who, like the Rockefellers, for example, or the Harrimans, were creating large uh, parkland. It, it, it was public will uh, that said that it was important to develop parks. That's why in, in Boston, there are nearly 5,000 acres worth of parks. Uh, it, it's because there's a public will to invest in a kind of infrastructure, um, which in the case of parks might be used for uh, recreational purposes, but which also have environmentally uh, sound purposes uh, for water management and a range of other things. And so the question of what our legacy is doesn't necessarily have to relate to whether we think our own grandchildren will be beneficiaries. Uh, we can simply say that for the region and for the city that we're living in, we're making a better place. And often, as is the case, for example, with the creation of new parkland or the redoing of Winnet Circle and, and Fort Point Channel and you know, getting corporations to invest in, in resilient infrastructure, um, there are shorter term benefits as well. I mean, a promenade along the Fort Point Channel would be something that people would use the way we use the Esplanade along the Charles now. So there are short term benefits that accrue, but clearly, some of them are long term as well. Hi, um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, personalizing the climate change issue, which we were talking about earlier, and also reaching out to people across the aisle who don't necessarily agree with us. Um, it reminded me of a conversation I had with one of my more conservative friends last uh, semester about why he would support politicians um, who vote for or vote against environmental regulation in the, in the local cities and towns. And um, he felt that people on our side, I guess the liberal side, of wanting to fight climate change ignore the personal problems that come with things like closing coal plants or closing increasing oil prices. And, uh, and that like the innovations in the green energy side don't necessarily translate to those people who are getting laid off in the coal plants and the fossil fuel industry. So can you talk about maybe ways you want to engage with those people who feel that way? And if you feel like you haven't been doing that enough, or if you feel like you do have strategies to engage with those people? I mean, that was a little bit of what I was talking about with that Texas story, was that there, that, that there are places that show, and maybe this even goes to the point earlier about how to show what's happening in one region can sometimes translate to other regions on the local level, but there are um, places where the decisions are being made uh, not, like they're just heading towards something because it's it's cost competitive, because it's more stable, because there's more job opportunities there, because all these other reasons that are not uh, so driven by environmental concerns at all. Um, and I'm just like, the coal, the coal story is such a fascinating thing, even like I'm, I was in one of the towns in West Virginia and the mayor was very pro coal and she was and, and she's taking me all over the town and somebody walks by and she's like, yeah, we're gonna bring coal back. He's like, coal's dead. You know, and he was like a he was like an energy guy. But it's just like there's there's already that tension is there and I think it's just being politically preyed upon. But many people within those regions acknowledge that it's not coming back in the same way for all these other reasons. The natural gas is is killing coal more than solar panels. Yeah, that's true. And and you know, I think to answer your question, as journalists anyway, we, um, you know, I think that um, the tensions you're describing are interesting to us. I mean, I, I remember writing a story for the Times in West Virginia, probably eight years ago now, 
uh, were a single one of the last remaining mountaintops that had not been uh, shaved off using mountaintop removal mining, which is a really egregious way of, of extracting coal. Very cheap, mechanized, no labor, uh, very little labor required. Um, uh, efforts to to mine that mountain were up against uh, an alternative solution to that mountain, which was to put uh, wind turbines on top of it. And so you had half the town divided. Uh, over whether we should put turbines on top of this or whether we should be mined. And to me, that sort of crystallized this tension. But it was really important to me when I wrote that story to kind of talk into the coal mining community and figure out where um, where their values led. And I do think that too often um, journalists who are covering this issue um, fail to sort of uh, mine that perspective. Pardon me for using the pun. Uh, and, and I also think that there's a certain amount of static that journalists get from the left, from um, the political left, when they do attempt to do that. Um, you know, another example is when the, when the uh, Deepwater Horizon uh, oil spill happened. Uh, I was down there covering it like everybody else was. And, and one of the stories I wrote uh, was um, I, I flew out to a uh, an idled oil rig. All the oil mining had been shut down in, in the Gulf while this was happening. Um, and I wanted to do a story on, um, you know, we had done the sad fishermen and we had done the sad, <laughs> so I wanted to do the sad oil workers. Um, and it was a real story because this is a huge economic uh, driver in that, part of, in that part of the world. And a lot of people were out of jobs. And a lot of people were, were not bringing home paychecks. And a lot of them had families back on shore. Um, and so I wrote the story and ran it on the front page, and I got pillowed. I mean, I, I got attacked by, uh, you know, lefty greenies writing hate mail for, for doing the story. But these were real, these were real people who were real worried uh, about their lives. So I think that it's, you know, journalists need to seek it out, but I also think people who, who really feel strongly that we ought to be doing something about climate change do need to recognize that um, uh, there's a lot of people value things differently. And there are, um, that all the choices we make are going to have winners and losers, and we need to be sensitive to that. I think we, we aren't enough. Speaking of, oh, is it now on? Speaking of uh, dams, Massachusetts has several dams. We have a history of using dams for industry a couple hundred years ago. Some of those are still around here. We also have um, on the in the globe, uh, I don't know, maybe almost 10 years ago, um, a list of them all, and they told us which ones were um, hazard if they broke, but they never told us our condition. So that was kind of a a piece of information that would have been interesting to know which one should we be looking at. A lot of them are on first private properties, but nobody's asking the question about if it broke, whose house would go, even though it's the dam itself is on private property. So it's an issue that needs to be talked about. And so does what are energy you're going to, are we going to be using now that we don't have a contract with hydro from Canada. Someone on this side said that's not true and I'd like to <laughs> and with you. I thought so. Yeah, I don't think any of us know enough about it. I, I apologize Ted for uh, being sold out. I guess I, I, I'd like to make one comment. Oh, back. Going back to your comment about dams in South Carolina, I don't know about South Carolina. I can kind of guess based on the South Carolina politics. They don't know where their dams are and they don't know what they're like. I can tell you, having had a dam in North Carolina, they're very well regulated and very, and that is sort of a cultural difference between those two states. And until recently, North Carolina was a relatively liberal place compared to South Carolina. Uh, in, the, in terms of Massachusetts, in fact, uh, the regulators are fairly aggressive, and, and I've had to deal with 
one in Brookline, for instance, that admittedly they didn't recognize it was a dam as a reservoir um, until relatively recently, but, but they are working with the town in terms of those issues. And, and I would suggest that, in fact, there are a lot of hydro dams traditionally that were used to make, I mean, New England's, New England's textiles, all sorts of uh, mills were run by dams. And, and it's really a shame that we can't go back often with the equipment still there and, and some of it's still generating electricity. And I, I would strongly suggest that we should be doing more of that, not less. Can, can I just make one point, just going back to your your um, your question and the observation, is just that there's also all these other factors, like what, what you're bringing in about mechanization, like natural gas and mechanization destroy the coal industry in a lot of these places, not the narrative. And even, even I mean, so many people who are saying, oh, like Obama, it was all those things that made all the jobs go away. And it was like, well, actually not a single one of them was enacted in yet. So like, there's a lot of misinformation around those things. But so much of what has struck me coming out of this series, and um, so much of my reporting, because I was looking for highly conservative areas took me to highly rural areas. And that these places are just areas in transformation. And it was really striking to me after having done the same kind of work in India, where I was traveling mostly to rural areas, that the same dynamics are at play. They're at play at a global level. That people, um, kids are educated now. This is something we all want, right? But then when they're educated, they lose the opportunities to continue uh, doing things in their rural areas and they're moving to the cities. And I mean, with Georgia Peach Farmer, fifth generation, the son had just come back after working for Price Waterhouse in Atlanta, came home with his wife and his newborn baby to be the fifth, the fifth or the sixth generation peach farmer and the peach harvest failed. Like he gave up that job for this job, for this legacy of his family. So like there's all these dynamics that are at play um, that really complicate all of these issues. It's why I do hope there is more reporting that is covering stories that bring climate in along, you know, side by side with these other changes that are just happening to, to life on this planet, not just in any particular place or community, but just everywhere that this change is underway. And then climate change is going to be this layer that is going to simultaneously transform a lot of these places. Now, I'll say one more. Okay, and uh, then I'm going to ask our um, speakers if they have final comments, and I have a comment, but yes. When I think about climate change, I think about all the things you know, we're talking about, I think a lot about water security and food security. And I know that people here don't think, well, many people, unless they're having financial challenges, don't really think about food security in New England very much. But your story about Georgia beaches that sounds like a food security story to me. So why are we not more upset about the Georgia peach farmers? Is it because they're peaches? Is it because it's too far away from New England? Is it because something we may consider a luxury? But to me, if they can't, if they're suddenly not being able to grow them, that's in the US, it's immediate. It's, it's shown to be a large economic and obviously social problem for, because it supports this entire area. You know, what is it that journalists can do to make this all more real to those of us who aren't paying close attention the way I am? I don't know. I mean, it's what we try to do. You know, whether we're successful or not, I have no idea. But, I mean, that's that's what we try to do. I mean, I try to do it through narrative. Like, I feel like um, the facts of the matter have kind of failed and that we have enough of facts at this point. Like, we're still amassing a lot of information, not to discredit at all Dr. Tom and everybody else's work, but we need that information, but in terms of moving the needle on public policy level, because that's where the action needs to happen. Um, and I just feel like the only way forward, the, the only like bit of hope there is through narratives that somebody maybe reads the peace story, gives a damn about what happens in Georgia, and maybe starts connecting the dots, but I, I don't know how it happens with that. 
the others aren't commenting. I, I'd make a um, a quick comment. The article that uh, our matriculating students uh, read uh, for this class uh, relates uh, to the early stages of the environmental movement as we know it, which is to say, um, talks about the time in the 80s when we might have, according to the article, won uh, in terms of making more progress. And um, one of the things I, I always have to remember is that all the students who are registered in this class were born after that. <laughs> And that for those of us who, who started even before that with Ian McHarg and, and other environmentalists who talked about uh, coastal zone management and ways that protected um, the coast as an asset and dealt with issues of, of climate change, we, we set on a path. Um, but it's pretty clear that while we gained some traction in some areas, we failed dismally to gain traction in many other areas in terms of alerting folks to the implications and effects of climate change in a way that would have made the American auto industry, for example, as sensitive as the German auto industry is now in terms of you know, converting from fossil fuels, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that strikes me is that there was a long time when the image of climate change was a polar bear, um, as, as the visual uh, indicated early on, on, on a block of ice that was melting. I don't know what happened to that polar bear, um, but that iconography got a lot of people, particularly younger people, thinking about climate change in a way where I remember kids you know, asking, their parents, what are you doing about the polar bear? So whatever happened to the polar bear happened, but it does seem at this moment is that, that there's a need for a new iconography. The narratives are important. The narratives have to have a visual component as well that people can relate to. And maybe it's the Georgia peach farmer, or you know, maybe it's something that relates to the fires out west. I didn't know what it is. But it does strike me that in the same way that those polar bears got people on both coasts thinking about climate change in a way where many of them had never seen a polar bear other than on TV, that, that we can begin to rethink what the iconography is uh, as people who are involved with the media in a way to um, uh, mobilize and pressure uh, policymakers to, to actually act. Because we all acknowledge that we're way behind where we should be. And we've got folks who are working really hard to get us up to speed, but uh, the environment is changing faster than we are, at least in this country. So if folks have uh, closing comments. Um, <clears throat> thanks for having us, by the way. This is a great discussion. I, um, final comments. Um, I mean, this is the most important story on the planet today. It's full stop. Uh, if you're not, if we as journalists are not uh, finding ways to connect what's happening in the world um, to climate change, uh, I think in a lot of respects we're failing. It, it affects everything, economically, politically, culturally. Um, it's, it's pretty seamless. And, uh, it's there is no bigger story, um, but at the same time, I, I think that one one common thing is, and I think it arises from the, the climate piece of the New York Times, which is that we failed. This is the, we, the decision. This, this problem was identified in the 1980s. And we failed. And one problem I have with that is like, who's we? Um, who was in the room? Uh, you know, I know that, that I wasn't. Um, I know that a lot of uh, people who don't have a tremendous amount of power were not in that room. Um, and you know, if you if you really want to frame it correctly, I think that you have to do what's happening now, and it's taken a very long time to do, which is hold to account the people who were in a position to do something about this in the first place, the Exxon Mobiles, if you will, uh, who are now facing a lawsuit. Um, will that 
Will that change anything? No, but I do think that it, um, it's sort of unfair for us to kind of carry the burden of failing on this issue because there have been a lot of people who have been working for a very long time tirelessly uh, to, to raise awareness. And it's taken generations, uh, but I think it's all kind of going in the right direction. Um, and it's up against a lot of inertia. And it's left us journalists with a lot of questions about how do we, how do we keep, continue to address the story that we feel will be written over and over again. Um, but I do think it's going in the right direction. And I think we have to look, um, it's important to look at the right actors when we're talking about this issue. That's all I'll say. Well, a lot of great discussion points have been had and I really appreciate being part of it. Um, I really appreciate the fact that so many people in this institution are thinking about getting into this field because I think it's incredibly important that young people engage with this problem. There's, there's no doubt that uh, it's not going to be solved by the current generation. So um, I think that's extremely important. Nothing's going to happen until young people get mad about this. So get mad. Get out there and write lots of wonderful stories. Yes, I would agree. Get mad and, and act. And going back to what Tom said, vote. You know, this is, um, we like to think about baby boomers as like, the, they're the ones, the big voting block. No, no, it's, it's, it's Gen X, it's millennials, it's the ones that don't quite have a name yet, Gen Z or whatever they're, um, it's the college students now. If all those people are voting, and those are, you know, the, the studies have been done. Those people accept the science, they want to see action, and the reality is that it's, it's the issue that the younger generation is going to be dealing with in the most catastrophic ways for a long, long time. So it's immediate. And so getting people to, to you do what you can on your own personal level, but um, it has, the change has to come at a, a much more macro level than that. And voting is one way to make that happen. And thank you. Good. Well, thanks everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And one last comment on next week. Uh, one of our speakers, one of our presenters next week is the person who wrote the article on the uh, substantial number of uh, new condominiums uh, that have been developed in Boston which uh, sit empty uh, as uh, investment vehicles. And for those of you who are particularly interested in having a conversation about gentrification and development patterns uh, next week is a topic. Uh, also for the class, for the students in the class, I have a message from Jonathan. So a quick PSA just to everyone on your midterms. Uh, <laughs> make sure to also send it as an email to Jonathan. And if Blackboard is uh, hard to work with, write it up as an essay with your two questions and then submit it as an attachment. <laughs> I don't think so. No. I don't think so. <laughs> Sorry, I have to say it sometimes. <laughs> You're frightening me thinking I have a chance. <laughs> <laughs>